Hello everybody, James Cards FC here. Thanks for clicking on this video. Uh, if you're one of my subscribers, thanks for coming back. And if you're a new viewer to my channel, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I think this is a great starting point if you clicked on this video specifically for what the title is. And I apologize to my current subscribers as they probably already know everything that I'm going to be talking about. But for you, the new viewer, this video is specifically made for you. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the soccer card market, uh, total landscape in general, and everything you need to know to to get started in this market. Um, this video, once again, directed at you, the viewer that has no idea what they're doing in the soccer card market or has heard about it, but doesn't know what to do to get involved. Um, I want to take you through the steps to understand everything you need to know at a basic level in order to go ahead and get started in this market. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get through this. And I'll start off with my experience in the soccer card market. I think it's a good idea for the new viewers and maybe even some of my current subscribers to understand where I come from in this market and the experiences that I have um, going into it and why I choose to play in this market. So um, my experience as an American, uh, naturally, I collected baseball cards as a kid. I think this is really common for most Americans to start off with collecting baseball cards or basketball cards. Usually your parents were really into it. They were always available at Target at the grocery store. So it was common that you would open packs as a kid, at least where I was raised in, in the United States. So uh, throughout high school and college, my main hobbies shifted to FIFA and specifically FIFA Ultimate Team. Uh, I was Division One in the years of 2014 and 2015, so I was taking the game very, very seriously. And the market aspect of Ultimate Team always really appealed to me, and so I took that seriously as well. Um, if you play a lot of FIFA Ultimate Team, you're probably like me, and you spend even more time just engaging with the market than you actually do playing the game itself. So. On that subject, in 2019, I was randomly recommended a YouTube video talking about physical sports cards as investments, and it brought back the nostalgia that I had felt from collecting as a child, as well as it appealed to the um, new market knowledge that I was getting from the FIFA Ultimate Team market, and so it sort of paired up those two things together and led me to exploring the soccer market in particular. So uh, I decided to jump back into the sports card market, focusing mainly on basketball, which was the hottest market at the time in 2019, and soccer, which at the time was a completely unexplored market because the sports card market leans, at least at the time, leaned very American, and not a lot of Americans were very into soccer, uh, especially from a soccer cards perspective. So that market was extremely unexplored when I did enter it. So through complete dumb luck, I stumbled into buying rookie cards of Jaden Sancho, Erling Holland, and American produced cards of Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Neymar right before the market exploded. So for example, this Jaden Sancho rookie card right here, I was buying multiple for five dollars each and then the sales chart that you can see right here shows that about two years ago the card went from not existing to being worth uh 400 500 all the way up to a thousand dollars by hanging out in this 400 300 dollar range so through complete dumb luck, I was able to buy that card for $5 and sell it for $500. Now, that is not something that is currently available because the market has already exploded. And as you can see, as Jaden Sancho has gone through his career and he transferred to United and he's pretty much been a flop at this point, his prices have come back to earth and this is now around a $50 or $40 card. But from the time that I got in the market, I got very, very fortunate that I was in it before it really started getting going. So that gave me a huge first to market advantage and I've been involved with the market daily ever since. While my returns are never gonna be the returns that I show right here and you probably shouldn't expect those kinds of returns. Um, I do have the experience from the market from what it was like before it really ever existed to what it is like today. And so I wanna share that knowledge and pass that on to the new people that will be entering this market so that you can try and avoid the initial mistakes that I made. Obviously I didn't list those here, but I will talk about them in the future and we'll discuss those in later videos as well. So moving forward here to FIFA Ultimate Team in real life, and this is how I would run a comparison of this market very loosely. So FIFA Ultimate Team has one of the most competitive and engaged markets in the world, but at the end of the season, you start all over at zero and your investments and hard work over the year disappear as you have to start all over again for the next game. Um, in the physical card market, this doesn't have to be the case. So 
just a direct comparison here, you would have bought this FIFA Ultimate Team Edition, which would be $100 in September of 2021. Probably spent an hour, another $100 on FIFA points, if that's your thing. And this would all be worth $0 by the time the next FIFA releases, and you would again spend that same $100 or $200. Uh, if instead you would have bought this Kareem Benzema card with this autograph and patch in it, um, really cool looking card for Kareem Benzema, it, it would run you about $200 in August of 2021, so around the same time that FIFA came out. And now that card is currently worth $750 or more, um, depending on who you're able to sell it to. And when you sell it, it's worth somewhere around that range, uh, just based on how well Kareem Benzema has performed and the interest that has come up in his market over the past year or so. So another example here would be maybe you spent $100 and you didn't buy any FIFA points. And at the same case, you're still going to be at $0 when the new FIFA releases. You could have bought uh, two of these Darwin Nunez rookie cards. Uh, they were $50 each in September of 2021. And just a single one of them is currently worth $1,000. Now, that might be a little overvalued given the fact that people are super excited that he has transferred from Benfica to Liverpool. So those prices could drop a little bit in the near term future. But they will not, of course, drop all the way back down to $50 because you would have bought him when people weren't really caring about Darwin Nunez when he was at Benfica. So that $50 investment, or if you bought two of them, would have been a $100 investment, would have become either $1,000 or $2,000 today, whereas the money you spent on FIFA obviously does not come back to you in any form of ROI. And then from a very historical perspective, um, this is the Messi rookie card in PSA 10 condition. For those of you that don't know anything about grading or the card market in general, PSA is the biggest grader at the time in terms of both output and secondary market value. And PSA 10 is the highest grade. So this is the best condition possible of the Lionel Messi rookie card uh, or the most popular Lionel, Lionel Messi rookie card on the market. This card was $1,500 uh, nine years ago, and it is now upwards of $300,000. And you can see this crazy price increase that occurred just over the past three years in terms of the demand that came to the soccer card hobby. And we really are just getting started because as you can see, the hobby and the, the market basically didn't even exist um, in these first few uh, years. There's a five-year period where there's not a lot of activity. And then over the past three, we've really had this jump in market participants. And so I want to encourage more people to join this market because I think at this point in time, while we have sort of cooled off, I think we still have a long way to go in terms of the amount of people that could be interested in this market going forward. And I am very optimistic about this market in the long run. So uh, obvious question that you would ask here is which players should I be buying? And so I put together this slide here that talks about a few different things. So this really depends on your goals in the market. Traditional sports card market advice goes as follows. Long-term investing, you're looking at old retired players that have their legacies set in stone, and you just sort of stash those away for years and years and years, and eventually the values rise over time. There's also short-term trading, which is probably what you're used to if you play a lot of FIFA Ultimate Team, which is you move in and out of positions all the time. Uh, these are usually targeted for hot active players or prospects in the market where player performance throughout the year can adjust prices dramatically one way or the other. So... As a basic overview in the soccer card market, we refer to three basic eras. We have the vintage era, which includes cards, stickers, magazine cutouts, etc. Basically, anything from the countries where these were produced, however they did their collecting, uh, there were different ways of doing it. Some did cards, some had stickers, some had magazine cutouts, some had um, little disc pogs that they used. So... Any of those are fair game in the vintage market, and this would be from the 1970s and older. Um, specifically, we'd talk about the key players in this era being Pele, Maradona. Maradona's in this because um, 77 to 79 are his rookie cards, and then Cruyff as well as he has his rookie cards in this same vintage era. And the king of the vintage era currently is this Pele rookie card from 1958 that was produced in Sweden, and in the highest grade possible, it is now worth over a million dollars. It has already a sale above a million dollars, and it is likely at this time still valued at that same $1 million price point. So that is one of the holy grails of the soccer market. Uh, then you move into pre-modern, which is cards and stickers from the 1980s to mid-2010s. And the key players from this era, of course, would be guys like Zidane. Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Messi. This is that Messi card that I showed you previously in PSA 10 condition, and it is 
currently valued at around $300,000 on the market, despite being worth only $1,500 just nine years ago. Then we have the modern or ultra modern market, which consists of cards and stickers from the mid 2010s until now. And the key players from this era, of course, are Mbappe, Holland, and then whoever the hot prospect of the moment is. Currently, this is guys like Pedri and guys like Gavi, whereas previously it was guys like Anzu Fati and Jaden Sancho. So flavor of the month switches all the time based on player performance. But those are the types of players that receive a lot of interest in the ultra-modern or modern end of the market. This is a, a Kylian Mbappe card, a gold prism card. We'll talk about that set and a few other sets going forward. But this Kylian Mbappe card has sold for over $150,000, and that was a couple years ago. So it's likely at this point in time that this is worth more in the $200,000 to $300,000 range if it were to come up for sale again. So... The modern ultra modern market segment is by far the most active in the market. It has the most market participants and it has the most cash changing hands at a rapid rate. Because player performances can dramatically shift card values, people are most interested in this market, but it also makes it inherently more risky because your player can completely fall on the map off, fall off the map. Like in the Jaden Sancho example I gave you previously, his cards were selling for 500 plus dollars and now they're worth around 50 because he's no longer seen as the prospect that he once was. So that's the type of market that structure that we have currently in the modern, ultra modern end of the market. And another thing to keep in mind is that the amount of cards and stickers from the modern, ultra modern era are very large in comparison to others. So this right here is one of Messi's rookie cards or stickers. This is a sticker produced in Spain by Panini Este. And there are 171 of these graded by PSA, which, like I said before, is the biggest grader and authenticator in the space. If you take that same brand of sticker that was produced for Ansu Fati's rookie season, uh, there are 2,832 currently graded by PSA. So you can see just the insane levels of grading and awareness on the market that has happened within the past couple years as opposed to what it was like just 20 years ago at this point. So... Uh, next obvious question would be, what cards should I buy of the player that I'm looking for? So in most cases, a player's card from their rookie season will be the most valuable. However, however, certain limited edition cards can sell for higher premiums. In the modern or ultra modern market, some players have hundreds of cards produced in their rookie season. For example, Pedri, who I'll be going over here, has 200 something different rookie cards. And so I want to break down as easily as I can the Pedri rookie card market in case this is one of the players that you'd be interested in putting some money into perhaps you see him as a potential superstar and in which case you would assume his card values would increase as his legacy increases as well so let's go ahead and break down Pedri so uh, Topps Chrome is the flagship set for Topps which is one of the two biggest brands currently on the market and Topps Chrome is the most obvious most basic the set that everybody understands and knows on the market and it it is currently the go-to set for rookie cards, at least from the top side of the market. So uh, you have this base card, which is just a standard base card, nothing special to it. And then next to that, from the same set, you also have the limited edition refractor card. Think of these if, if in FIFA Ultimate Team you're used to informs. Basically, these are like informs or team of the season type cards. The the more rare you get, the more valuable they usually are. So this is a limited edition refractor card. It is not numbered, but it is shorter printed than this base card. Then you have limited edition numbered color cards, like this pink one right here, which is numbered, I believe, out of something like 299, whereas the limited edition refractor is not numbered and neither is the base card. Then in Topps Chrome, you also have limited edition numbered autographed color cards, which again are worth more than any of the ones we saw previously, depending on what they are numbered out of obviously a card numbered out of 50 is going to be worth more than a card numbered out of 150. Then from there we moved to a set like Topps Chrome Sapphire where the base card is now this much more beautiful and complex design. This is a higher end version of the base Topps Chrome set. It is Topps Chrome Sapphire. It's shorter printed and all the cards are in full colors as opposed to like this base card here from base Topps Chrome. So you have that as the base card, and then Topps Chrome Sapphire also has limited edition numbered color cards, like this yellow one here that I believe is out of 99, I think, but obviously you'll want to double check me on that. Um, there are limited edition numbered color cards for both the Topps Chrome and the Topps Chrome Sapphire set. 
And again, the lower the number, the more valuable the card. Then you also have the following sets down here for Pedri. You have Panini Mega Cracks, which is a very historic brand in the hobby, but there are only base cards. So the only cards in Panini Mega Cracks for Pedri are this card right here. He does not have any colors or autographs in the Mega Crack set. This is the only card for Pedri in that set. Then you also have Panini Mosaic, which has colored cards as well for Pedri, along with this base refractor version. You have Topps Stadium Club, which again has a variety of different colors and autographs in it. Same for Merlin, which also is down there Topps design that has more colors and more autographs. Then you have Topps Museum Collection, which introduces jersey or shirt cards, where the cards are based on the player's shirt and include patches of them. So that's another option for you if you're into that sort of thing. And then you also have a set called Tops Now, which is produced by the Tops website. And based on moments that happen throughout the season, players may receive a card. So for example, this card, I believe was from Fedri's Pedri's first ever match. It's a really nice card because it shows him and Messi sort of a passing the torch moment, uh, if you want to call it that. So a lot of people really like this card as well. And you know the exact print run of this card because it is listed on the Topps website, but this is the only version of the card. There's no colors, there's no numbers, and there's no autographs. So that is my basic rundown of the Pedri market. I will go into more details on specific players and their specific markets in later videos, but this is a basic overview of what an ultra-modern player in the market has in terms of their cards that are out there. So we'll go ahead and go through some more examples here. For Cristiano Ronaldo, his market is actually a lot easier. And the further you go back, usually the easier the player's markets are to understand. So for Ronaldo, you have this 2002 Panini rookie sticker and this 2002 Panini rookie card. And those are the only 2002 produced rookie cards for Cristiano Ronaldo. So unlike Pedri that has 200 plus rookies, uh, Ronaldo has two which makes that nice and easy to understand. Now, I also added in these right here. You have a 2014 Prism. Uh, this is a numbered color card. This set also has base cards and lower numbers and different colors on it. But the 2014 Prism set is usually looked at in terms of the hobby as the first really big worldwide American produced set. And so for that reason, it, re it receives a lot of notoriety and some very high prices because people place a lot of value on the historical importance of this set. This set really brought the soccer market into the modern era as opposed to the previous sets that are more pre-modern or vintage. In that same vein, you have 2017 Topps Chrome, which is produced by Topps, whereas Prism is produced by Panini. And this is basically Topps's version of that 2014 Prism set. They don't own the rights to the World Cup, so instead of seeing Cristiano Ronaldo in a Portugal kit, you see Cristiano Ronaldo in a Real Madrid kit for his club team, and there, this is the limited edition refractor version of the card, but there are also numbered versions of the card. There are golds, there are blues, there are purples, and they're all numbered to different numbers, and like I said previously, the lower the number, usually the more valuable the card. So that is a basic primer on Cristiano Ronaldo. Then you have a guy like Mark Van Basten, whose market is very, very simple because, again, he is an older player. Uh, this is his 1982 Panini Rookie sticker, and that is pretty much all there is to go to for Van Basten. You can get his second-year sticker, his third-year sticker, all those sorts of things, but his, his market is very easy to understand. He has one Rookie sticker and not really any modern releases because he retired long before we got into the 2014 and later modern market. So if you're looking for Van Basten, you're pretty much one-stop shopping for his most important um, carp. And then we move into a guy like Darwin Nunez, who is a really interesting example of an ultra-modern player that does not have a lot of releases. So Darwin Nunez, because he was in the Portuguese League and not a lot of sets are produced for the Portuguese League, only has two rookie cards as opposed to Pedri, who had all those rookie cards I showed previously. All he has is a 2020 Panini rookie sticker and 2020 obsidian cards which are also produced by panini and this set includes only limited edition cards so this is the base version of that limited edition card it is numbered out of 195 and then there are 12 parallels of it that are numbered lower and lower and lower as you go through the colors so those are the only two sets for darwin nunez so his market is super easy to understand in its current iteration as well then down here we'll go through Lionel messi I listed out all of his rookie cards here. This is currently seen as the holy grail for Messi rookie cards. It is a more premium card. It came from the 2004 Panini Mega Cracks set, which is one of the most respected and historic sets in the hobby. So 
for a variety of reasons, this is currently seen as the best Messi rookie card. And then you also have from 2004 Panini Mega Cracks as well, you have these Barcelona team set cards. This set was produced specifically for the team after they won uh, La Liga for the 2004 season. So these came out after the season and are also considered Messi rookie cards, however, not valued nearly as much as this one right here. So you also have those three options. Then you have the 2004 Mundi Chromo rookie card, which was produced by Mundi Chromo, um, a brand that no longer really produces cards or stickers, but at the time, this was a very popular release in Spain. Then you also have the 2004 Panini Este rookie sticker. At the time of its production, it was the most popular Messi rookie, but over time, the 2004 Panini Mega Cracks has overtaken it, but this is Messi's only rookie sticker. And then you also have the 2004 Mundi Chromo Top Liga rookie card. This card features four different players on it, so if you turn it over to its backside, you'll see two additional players. There is a base version and a refractor foil version that has this rainbow background effect, just like this 2017 Ronaldo does. And so those are two other messy rookie cards and that completes the list of messy rookie cards on the market as you can see he has many more than ronaldo does it's just what happened uh in that season there's no rhyme or reason to it it just is that some players end up having more cards released in their rookie season than others and that is just how the market flows so uh, next question would be, where do I learn about card sets? So there's a variety of different resources to start from. I would highly recommend starting with one player and then learning all their cards available through each set. An easy starting point would be going on eBay and typing in Ronaldo 2002 and seeing what comes up, followed by Ronaldo 2003, 2004, and through the years until you get a good grasp of what releases are for each year. There are also specific databases that are made for cards. The PSA Population Report, which PSA is one of the biggest graders in the space, like I've said a few times before. They have an easily searchable database that includes all cards graded by PSA. I'll leave a link to this below, and I'll probably do an entire video on how to use the PSA Population Report to understand uh, what cards are out there for specific players and what grades are most common for those cards. Uh, Beckett, which is another one of the biggest graders in the space, also has a checklist website where it is an easily searchable database that includes all cards produced for a player in each season. However, there are some holes. Beckett's website does not include stickers, and it does not include some of the older vintage or pre-modern releases. So you have to use that with caution, but I'll leave a link to it as well. It is really good specifically for the modern and ultra-modern end of the market. I would also recommend highly creating a soccer card specific Instagram account to follow fellow market participants. This will give you exposure to many different types of cards as well as give you access to people that know a lot about the market and are probably in the market daily that can help you out when you're first getting started. Uh, well, like I say here, while the soccer card market is still developing, there are a there are a good amount of great content creators to follow on Instagram, and I can only imagine there will be more and more in the future as we continue to grow this market. Uh, me personally, feel free to send me a DM, especially if you have any questions about starting out. My at is jamescardsfc, and my DMs will be open, and I look forward to trying to help out anybody that I can get started in this market. Lastly, I would recommend joining Discord groups with fellow market participants. I personally am most active in the Soccer Study Discord group that focuses on pre-modern cards, but that group also discusses ultra-modern and vintage cards as well, and I'll leave the link down below to join that. As you start communicating with more people in Instagram or Discords, even on this channel, they can probably give you links to other Discord groups that might fit your interests better, but I'll go ahead and leave a link to the Discord that I am personally the most active in. Alrighty, then we'll move into where do I buy and sell cards? Obviously, if you're going to be in this market, you have to know how to buy and sell in this market. So depending on your country, your main marketplaces should have these cards available. In the United States, you're going to be dealing with eBay, which is a peer-to-peer -peer selling platform for all items, ComC, which is a peer-to-peer -peer selling platform for cards only, PWCC, which is a peer-to-peer -peer selling platform for cards only as well, and then Golden Auctions, which is an auction platform specifically catering to high-end cards valued at $1,000, $10,000, $100,000, $1 million. So on the higher end of the spectrum, you'll probably be looking at things like Golden, but for your day-to-day -day activity, more so eBay, ComC, and PWCC. So I'll leave links to all those websites down below. Check them out and start getting used to how they all different how they different function, uh, how their search mechanisms work, and all those things like that. So in Europe, 
Uh, you'll also have these right here. You should have access to all these websites as well as your own country's version of eBay or an eBay alternative. Uh, I list some of these down here below. Catawiki for the Netherlands, Total Collection for Spain, and Laban Coin for France are examples of eBay alternatives that are used to buy and sell cards. Um, if you're a seasoned ultimate team player for FIFA, you already know the best strategy in the market is to not buy packs, but rather to buy the specific cards that you want instead of just hoping to hit something in a pack. So in the soccer card market, we would call that buying singles as opposed to buying wax. Singles meaning single cards and wax meaning wax boxes. So on average, you'll be making back about 30% of your initial payment on wax. So that's more akin to gambling, whereas uh, if you just buy the single, you're getting exactly what you want. So, for example, in this Topps Chrome set from 2020, the price of the box is probably very similar to the price of this blue numbered Kareem Adeyemi autographed rookie card. And so if you're interested in getting the Kareem Adeyemi, you're much better off just buying the card rather than buying the box and hoping you hit that card. So uh, where do I learn? Uh, where? Do I learn how much a card is worth? This is one of the questions that I think a lot of the people entering the market have and are not sure where to go for it. So I'll break this down here. The websites that I showed in the previous slide will have sales histories available for you to dig through. So eBay will have a sales history. ComC has sales history. PWCC has a super great sales history. It's probably the best one that is out there. And then Golden Auctions probably has the worst sales history to look through. So it's a pain, but if you're looking for high-end stuff, they do have sales history as well. In addition, you also have third-party tools like Market Movers, Card Ladder, and Card Hedge that produce sales graphics with nice user interfaces. However, memberships to these tools cost monthly fees, and apart from Market Movers, which is the most expensive, most of these tools lack a large variety of soccer cards. They're more focused on the baseball, basketball, and football side of the market, which are currently the biggest sports card markets. So... For example, right here, this Jane Sancho rookie card price history that I showed previously is a graphic that I personally made in Card Ladder. Um, if you're going to be engaging with the market daily, I'd recommend at least doing a free trial of some of these tools so you can see how you would use that data and how it works and if it's something you would find value in. Um, while the data these tools give you are nothing that you cannot find on your own, they can be a great visual aid and time saver so that you don't have to go through and look at all these sales. You can just plot them on a graph and be done with it. So. If you're going to be in this market daily or weekly, I'd recommend at least giving these a free trial. I personally um, use Card Ladder. I know it is not the best for soccer cards, but I, I manage different parts of the market uh, for other sports as well. So for me, I, I do like how easy it is to use that product. But I know Market Movers, for example, has more soccer specific cards. So if you're interested in that, I would give that a look. Basically, do some free trials and figure out if this is something you would find value in. Alrighty, um, special note for non-Americans here, the market is currently American-dominated. More than 50% of the buyers and the product are located in the United States. So that's just the way the market is. Um, sports card collecting in American culture has gone back further and for higher values than it has in other countries. So it also happens to be the case with soccer that most of the market, at least, is currently dominated on the American side. This could definitely change in the future, especially with how global soccer is as a sport. But in the meantime, um, the American market currently dominates the market. With that being said, this is an advantage in terms of soccer knowledge and cards produced outside of America. However, um, since the majority of your activity on the market will be American-based, you will need to make use of American resources. So Ship My Cards is a great resource that can house your cards in America so you don't have to deal with customs fees and shipping fees if you live in Europe. So you can just send your purchases to Ship My Cards and they will manage your card portfolio for you and allow you to ship them different places from that one location. Um, Ship My Cards also allows you to send these cards to American grading companies easier, which are currently by far the market leader so if you want to do any grading of your cards, Ship My Cards can assist you in that process. Whereas if you were to do that on your own, you would buy the card in America, ship it to yourself in Europe, pay a bunch of customs fees, and then ship it back to America to get graded only for the shipping, only for the grading company in America to ship it back to you in Europe. And you're going to be, going to be dealing with a lot, of, a, a lot of hoops there and a lot of extra fees that you wouldn't have to deal with if you just use something like Ship My Cards to house your cards for you in America. Um, in addition to that, PWCC is another vaulting service in the United States that will house your cards for you, and their website also hosts auctions, a live marketplace, and allows you to easily transfer cards to new owners that also have PWCC accounts, so I would definitely recommend checking that 
service out, not only for the Europeans watching this or non-Americans watching this, but also for the Americans that maybe aren't using PWCC yet. I think they offer a great service. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about card grading really quickly. Um, in the soccer card market, buyers pay a premium for cards based on condition. And in theory, this makes a lot of sense, right? The better condition the card, the more valuable the card. So an example here is this Anzu Fati Mega Cracks rookie card from 2019. Uh, if you buy this raw, which means ungraded, it's around $20. If you grade this and get a PSA 5 on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, you're going to end up with about $10. If this grades a PSA 9, it's worth currently around $90. And if this grades a PSA 10, which is very difficult to do, um, it is currently $1,200 in value. Now, different cards are easier to grade than others. Different cards are harder to grade than others. So these values shift dramatically based on how hard it is to get all those grades. And I'll probably be doing a whole separate video on grading and, and populations and how hard things are to grade and stuff like that in the future. But as a general introduction, this is how Anzu Fati's uh, rookie card grades look like in terms of value. So there are currently four major grading companies, and all of these are headquartered in the United States. If you're going to be doing any grading, I highly, highly, highly recommend you stick to the American companies because you're going to take a beating on the secondary market if you try and sell something that is not in an American slabbed case. That is just the way the market is right now. So for PSA, which is the market leader in terms of output and selling premium, it uses a 1 to 10 grading scale with 10 being the gem mint grade. There is no 9.5 grade as opposed to some of the other grading companies that I'll talk about here in a second. And if I go over here to show you in May of 2022, the items graded, you can just see how many cards PSA grades compared to the other two. And PSA cards get a premium because of that. It is the most widely used brand. If you're into comic books, they are the CGC of the card grading world. Um, for BGS, you have the former market leader in terms of both output and selling premium. Back in the 2010s and 2000s, Beckett was actually head-to-head -head with PSA, but now they have fallen way, way behind, and through the years, every year, they have dropped a little bit lower and lower than PSA, both in terms of output and price, but they are still well-respected. Um, they use a 1 to 10 grading scale with 9.5 being the gem mint grade and 10 being a gem mint plus grade. Now, PSA does not give a gem mint plus grade. They only give grades 1 to 10 with no 9.5s, whereas BGS, their top grade is a 9.5, but they have a top, top grade of a BGS 10. And that might be a little bit confusing, and that confusion is part of the reason why BGS has slid back. PSA is way easier to understand, but just know that the BGS 9.5 grade is theoretically equal to the PSA 10 grade. Then you have SGC, who is quickly rising to prominence as the number two or three grader in the market. They use a 1 to 10 grading scale with 10 being the gem mint grade, but they also have a 9.5 grade, which means mint plus. Whereas, like we said before, PSA is just 1 to 10 with a 9 and a 10. SGC has a 9, a 9.5, and a 10, and SGC 10 theoretically equals PSA 10. Then you have CSG, which is new to sports card grading, but is the biggest comic book grader in the market. They are C CGC for comic books and CSG for sports cards. They use a 1 to 10 grading scale with 10 being the gem mint grade with no 9.5, but there is a 10 plus. CGC, or sorry, CSG gets really confusing because over the past few months, they recently completely changed their grading standards. They used to use 9.5s. They no longer use 9.5s. They now use 10s. It's really confusing. I personally wouldn't buy their slabs, but they're currently the cheapest company to grade with right now. So people do use them, but their grading system is really confusing. And I personally would advise against it, especially starting out just because it, it gets confusing when you're dealing with their old slabs versus their new slabs. So, and again, here are the outputs for those major grading companies. As you can see, PSA is miles and miles and miles ahead of everybody else right now. So, uh, in conclusion here, the soccer card market is a growing market with huge potential as the world's biggest sport, and from an ROI perspective, it's obviously much better than spending money on FIFA points because uh, your money doesn't disappear at the end of the year unless you invested it in Jaden Sancho and he ends up retiring or something like that, or, or you invested in Mason Greenwood, now you're probably out of money. So that, that is the way in which you would run out of money in this sense. Um, the main goal of my channel going forward, at least in the near term, will be to help new people enter the market. And with this in mind, please let me know in the comment section which topics you would like to see discussed in detail or 
again, just send me a DM on Instagram and I should have time to go ahead and answer through all of your questions in regards to getting started in the market. For my experienced subscribers, let me know what kind of content would have helped you the most when starting out. And please do us all a favor and share this video with your friends. The more people that we have in the market, the bigger we grow going forward. And the more people we have in the market, the more activity we have in the market. The more activity we have in the market, the better for prices and all that fun stuff. So the more we get people in the market, the better it will be for all of us going forward. Um, I will continue to create my higher level content catered to my subscribers with prerequisite market experience. However, I believe it is most important for the growth of our market to include more 100 level lectures that can be understood by all audiences rather than my usual graduate level lectures for experienced market participants. So that will be my main focus going forward. I will still give the deep dive analytical videos that you are probably accustomed to if you're a subscriber of this channel, but over the next few months, I really wanna focus on trying to drive new market participants into this market and I will be creating content that caters mostly to them and so if you're a viewer that has been subscribed to me for a while i apologize the deep dive data videos are probably going to slow down in their frequency but if you are a or if you are a new viewer to the channel i i welcome you and i will be going through as easily and as understandably as i can exactly how you can get started in this market and the tips and tricks that i have picked up over the past few years experiencing experiencing this market daily so with all that being said, I thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. Leave a like, leave a comment, feel free to subscribe for more content like this, as well as the usual content that you have been accustomed to. However, probably at a less frequent rate, at least a less frequent rate, at least in the midterm. Um, as far as comments, please leave me something about what you think would be important to go over. Or if you are a new member of this market, please leave a comment with what doesn't make any sense or questions you would have going forward. And like I said, if you're one of my longer time subscribers or you've been in this market for a while, if you could leave a comment on what would have been most helpful for you entering the market, that'd be great. And I'd love to do a video on it. So with all that being said, thank you guys so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe for more, and I will see you in the next video.